Hi, and welcome to another episode of Ask Two Lawyers. I'm Keith Davidson. I'm Stuart Albertson. So the topic today is how do you prove, I want to prove who unplugged my camera. How am I going to do it? Because when we're working on the cases like we're working on with uh, undue influence, so somebody comes in, a bad actor comes in, they change the trust, they change the will, and they're going to do it behind the scenes, right, Stuart? They're never going to like do it in a way that's obvious. Nobody stands up after a parent dies and goes, ooh, it was me. I'm the one who unduly influenced them to leave me everything. That's just kind of my thing. That's what I like to do. Uh, so you're not going to have any direct evidence. And people, the other thing that we get a lot of is people uh, demand that we show them all written evidence. Show us all written evidence as to how uh, this person unduly influenced the parent. Well, nobody writes these things down. I mean, when you're engaging in undue influence or fraud, you know, if you have half a brain, you're not going to sit there and write down what you're doing and put it in some sort of documentary form. So it always comes back to the issue of, well, how are you going to prove this? How are we going to make our case in court? And what type of evidence do we need to find and locate? And how do you go about doing these sorts of things? So, uh, Stuart, why don't you tell us your thoughts in terms of how are we going to prove our undue influence case when it comes time to go trial? Well, you just ran through all the, the issues that we do, but uh, I'll try to uh, extrapolate a little bit further on what you were saying. So when I was a young lawyer, uh, I was always concerned in answering written discovery or in depositions, uh, questions from the opposing side. And those questions generally would be along the lines of show us all documentary evidence that this person lacked capacity, show us all documentary evidence that there was an exercise of undue influence over this person. And it's frustrating because you as a lawyer want to have answers to that because you feel like if you don't have answers to that, then how are you going to prove your case? What are you going to put on at trial? How are you going to show that undue influence occurred here or that there was a lack of capacity at the time a will or a trust was signed? And so that's it's difficult, but I'm here to give freedom. I'm here to give freedom to all lawyers, old, young, middle-aged. I'm going to give you freedom if you're the one trying to prove undue influence or lack of capacity. And that is you simply don't have to do it with direct evidence, okay? And so when you have that little uncomfortable moment in time where you're like, I don't have any evidence that the undue influence actually took place on this date and this time, that's okay. That's okay. California law is here to help. There's a case called Lentz versus Lentz, and it uh, was decided in 2014. Uh, Lentz versus Lentz, 20, 222 Cal Out 4, 1346 for the nerds out there that want to actually look it up. And the court there really did a good job of basically pulling together what California law already stated, but making it so that the less dense members of, of the profession like myself could understand that you don't need to fear the fact that you don't have direct evidence of undue influence. And so the court there says, look, it's a rare case where you can prove undue influence with direct evidence. It's just rare, it doesn't happen. I mean, how many undue influencers out there write down, I'm planning on undue in, un, uh, exercising undue influence over mom today, and I'm gonna get her to give me all the assets out of the, the family trust and family assets, and I'm gonna screw my brother and sister nobody puts that in writing and, and nobody would. And so uh, same thing with mom and dad lacking capacity. Nobody says mom and dad don't know what they're doing today. They're bonkers. And I had them sign a trust. So those things generally just don't happen. And so Lentz versus Lentz comes along and says, hey, we're going to allow you to prove up an undue influence claim through the use of circumstantial evidence. Circumstantial evidence. In other words, we're going to take the totality of the circumstances, all the facts in the case, and we're going to look at them and we're going to say, it, it, does this add up to an exercise of undue influence? But Lentz goes one step further. We're going to get into the circumstantial evidence, Keith. I'd like you to walk through some of that. But Lentz goes even further and says, but there's even better news for you when you're trying to prove up an undue influence case where mom or dad created a trust or a will or a change, an amendment to a trust or a will or a statement. And it kicks everybody out except one person or a kicks you out or whatever the case may be, the court says if the person kick, you know, helping mom and dad create this new trust through the exercise of undue influence, if they meet certain criteria, which are fairly simple to meet, then we're going to take the burden of proof, that proof that you're so worried about as a lawyer in one of these cases, 
and we're going to shift it to the other side, to the bad actor. And the bad actor, if these elements are met, they're going to have to prove that they didn't exercise undue influence over mom or dad or whatever the case may be. So good news, don't have to have direct evidence, although we'll take direct evidence if we have it. You can use circumstantial evidence, which is good, the totality of the circumstances based upon the facts we have through the testimony of witnesses and documents. And then thirdly, if you meet some very simple criteria, three simple criteria, you can actually shift the burden of proof to the other side and you can sit back and eat bonbons while they have to prove that they did not exercise undue influence over mom. So uh, that's basically my view of it, Keith. And uh, maybe you can ex expound on some of the things I've talked about. Let's 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 take some very specific examples. So, okay, we understand that it can be circumstantial evidence, but what does that mean? So let's start with something that you see quite often. Let's say the the person who received the entire estate is you know the old the eldest child the eldest son receives all of the estate, and he actually drove mom to see the lawyer when the trust was changed. The fact that he drove mom to see the lawyer that is circumstantial evidence, or it could be circumstantial evidence. Does that prove that he engaged in undue influence? And, and the answer to that would be just that fact alone, likely no. Okay. But in, in a collection with other facts, it may be something we want to look further into. Okay. And that's, that's kind of going towards my point, which is when you're proving something by circumstantial evidence, it's kind of like death by a thousand lashes, right? So you're going to have to start putting together more and more facts in order to support your case. So circumstantial evidence is allowable and it's a proper type of evidence, but it's different from direct evidence in my mind in the sense that you have to build the outer walls of this circumstantial evidence to get where you want to go versus if somebody literally did send a text saying, Hey, I'm unduly influencing mom to leave me everything. You know, that would be direct evidence. And that's, you know, a much quicker route to proof. You never have that. Nobody's going to do that. So, okay. So driving mom to the uh, lawyer, that in and of itself may not, may not be enough for undue influence. Let's say that the son, he also uh, stepped in and he took over all of mom's finances. So he's paying all the bills. He's watching her checking account. He's intercepted all of her bank and brokerage account statements. So mom can't see those anymore. Is that fact alone undue influence, enough to prove undue influence? I'd say it remains in the same category as the other fact. It's interesting. Why did Sonny Boy drive mom to the uh, attorney to, to sign the, the, the new will or the new trust? That's certainly interesting, and we want to know more about it, but that in and of itself is not enough. The fact that Sonny Boy is acting as an agent under a power of attorney here, taking over the finances, you, you made it more nefarious maybe than it is. You said that he's blocking everything from mom. We don't know if he's blocking everything from mom, but he's he's in charge of the finances. That's interesting. So now we take those two facts and we start melding them together. And then we look for other facts, but you said in isolation by itself, is that enough? It's probably not enough by itself, but it's, it's like that game when you were a kid, you're getting warmer, you know, you're getting warmer, yeah. you're getting to the area where now we're starting to build on that facts and creating that picture from all the facts that something isn't right here. And I, I want to add one more thing, Keith, and I want you to keep going here. But one other thing to think about here is there's probably an objective and a subjective type of circumstantial evidence, right? And I think people are fearful because they think they're going to have to prove the circumstantial evidence by subjective facts. You know, no, that's not true because, and you're probably going here next, what about just an unnatural provision in a will, especially if it goes against a previous will where all the kids were getting everything equally, and now only one of them is getting. That's an objective fact that there's there, there was an intent by the, the parents to give everything equally to their children in the past, and now they're only giving it to one. Now, they might have truly intended that, and it might be appropriate. It might be an appropriate exercise of their power as, as people that own these assets to do, but it's interesting. It's an interesting question. And that is why is mom and dad going from giving everything equally to their children, which is what most people do. And now just giving everything to Johnny. Well, yeah. And you have to be very careful with those objective facts too, because it's 
parents have the right to be unfair. And so a lot of times what you're going to hear uh, from our clients or potential clients or people who ask us about this topic, they say, well, it's not fair. You know, this isn't what should have happened. Well, parents can be unfair. So the fact that a parent changed, even if it was a longstanding estate plan, it could be for years and years, the parent wanted it to go equally to the kids. But shortly before they de their death, they changed their mind. If they're the ones who truly changed their mind and they did it of their own accord without being uh, the subject of undue influence, they have the right to do that. They could literally take a child who has devoted their life to a parent, done everything for that parent, and then they can just change their mind unless there's some other like contractual claims or they've made promises. But there is, you know, there's this concept of it's not fair. Okay. Well, that in and of itself doesn't mean anything legally speaking, um, just taken as its own as its own thing. But if you start to meld that in with these other facts, which is what we're showing, essentially what we're doing by using circumstantial evidence is we're building, building our evidentiary house and you have to build it from the ground up and you're putting in fact after fact after fact. So if you take our example of the son drives mom to the lawyer, the son takes over the finances, the lawyer creates a plan that now benefits son exclusively and, and takes out all the other children, which was part of a plan that's been in place for 20 years. Now you're starting to get a flavor of something and it's a story that's coming out. And then the next step usually is the son will take over the medication. He's responsible for giving the parent or not giving the parent medication, doctor's visits, um, you know, and then you see in a lot of the, you know, severe cases, isolation. And isolation is I'm not going to let the other siblings talk to mom or come see her or be able to reach her on the phone. And now you're starting to see a sequence of facts that suggest that somebody's up to no good, essentially is what it comes down to, because it's so much easier to unduly influence an elder when they're isolated and they can't get the other side of the story. And so if I tell you all sorts of bad things about a family member and they can't defend themselves and they can't come in and give you the other side of the story, it's going to be much easier for me to persuade you to do something, right? And so what other type of facts would we be looking for? I mean, we've talked about the finances, the medicine, you know, what, what, what else goes into kind of putting all of this together as our evidentiary house as we're building this? So, uh, sorry, I have a, somebody joining me in the, in the stream here. Uh, so the other, thing we, the other thing we want to look at is, the uh, physical and the mental capabilities of the elder or of the parents. And generally, they're an elder. Um, they're generally in their 70s or 80s, in some cases, 90s. And so, uh, you know, we want to look at that. And sometimes it's more of a physical ailment and primarily physical, but their, their brain is so good, but they're completely reliant upon the bad acting son. So the bad acting son has a lot of authority, a lot of apparent authority and actual authority over the parent. Um, and then other times it's they're physically fit, uh, physically fit, relatively speaking, for an 80 or 90 year old, but their mental capacity has declined due to dementia, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's. There's all kinds of things that can, that, you know, some people have these uh, transient ischemic attacks that we've learned about, these mini strokes that add up over time. And some people just have full blown strokes. Uh, all these things start to affect the mind. If somebody's a raging alcoholic their whole life, they can have alcohol-induced dementia. So there's all kinds of things that can happen that can take away a person's ability to resist that exercise of undue influence. Yeah, and that's so important too because you have to have a vulnerable victim and it can take so many different forms. And once you start layering in all those different mental conditions that are happening, you start to break down the ability of the, of the elder to resist that excessive persuasion. And that's really all undue influence is at the end of the day is excessive persuasion. So you have somebody who's in a weakened state and now we're seeing different actions that are coming in. Uh, now, what about the interaction of the, of the child who receives the whole estate and their interaction with the other siblings? Because a lot of times that can be telling too in terms of them either being hostile or, or um, silent or who knows what to the other siblings, you know, wh what do you think in terms of those types of facts? Well, as you said, they could be hostile or, or get along or not get along. They generally don't get along after the other siblings find out that they're not in the trust. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a factor. It's not a factor in and of itself. That's enough to carry the day, 
but it's certainly something to look at is what, what is the relationship between the siblings? And there's, you know, it's a rare family where there's not some issue between siblings. Um, you, everybody thinks, you know, it's always, it must be just my family that doesn't get along. No, most families have, have uh, uh, people that don't get along and don't care to spend a lot of time with one another. And then when mom and dad pass away, uh, it turns out to be a uh, free for all because it, now nobody's there to see the bad behavior any longer. And the kids just go after each other. Yeah. And it's not, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy what happens when a parent dies. And a lot of times a mom or dad is kind of somehow keeping the whole clan together. And then when they're gone, you know, chaos <laughs> comes out and things go every which way. And then what about the other uh, thing that's interesting in these types of cases is the testimony of the drafting attorney, which, you know, they say that the drafting attorney's testimony is supposed to be given great weight, but we see a huge divergence in terms of what attorneys are doing out there when they're creating estate plans. And certainly there's a lot of good estate planning attorneys who are doing things the right way and they're being careful and they're taking safeguards, but it seems to be that there's quite a few that are not and that, you know, get themselves into some trouble when it comes to the estate plan and, and how it's created. So what are some of the top things that you're looking for when you're deposing a drafting attorney in order to try to assemble more evidence? Well, most drafting attorneys, when I start taking their deposition, they're very defensive. They know you're there to attack their work product um, and to attack the plan they put together. And so they're very defensive and they almost not almost, they believe they're advocates of this plan and they will fight to make this plan happen. And so part of my job is just to talk with the estate planner, let them know, look, I'm not asking you to, to make anything up. I'm not asking you to add to anything today or take away from anything. I just want the truth and I just want to know what you knew and that's it. I, I'm not here to beat you up. I just want to know what's going on. And so you take their deposition. Now I will say I'm a little harder on some drafting attorneys in deposition than others, the ones I'm hard on are the ones who lie to you and say, oh yeah, I don't have my notes. And I think what this person um, doesn't realize is that I've taken you know, hundreds of these depositions. And so when you hear the same old excuses over and over again, you kind of like, okay, here are the same old, old excuses. So you know why they don't have their notes? Because they were lost or destroyed, or there was water damage to the, to the, the office building. Uh, the big one you hear about electronic notes and electronic emails and those types of things. Oh, yeah, we had a, a server issue or we had a malware issue and, and we lost all of our files. And so, it, you know, those ones are hard. And, and then there's ones where they charge $500 to do an amendment, which I don't know how, how any lawyer makes their money doing that. I suppose some people could figure that out. But it's $500 to do an amendment that transfers millions and millions of dollars away from you know, some kids and gives everything to one kid. Um, and yet they put down that they worked on the case for five or six hours. And I'm like, wait, you, you got paid $500 as a lawyer and you spent five or six hours on this case. And you know, th those, those I, I tend to have a problem with because I think that lawyer is going further than they need to. All they need to do is tell the truth. I, the person showed up, they said they wanted to change their will. I asked them if anybody was giving them a hard time. They said, no. I drafted it, they signed it, and that's the, that's the extent of it. I'm okay with that testimony. I just don't want the lawyers adding anything to it and being advocates for a plan. And then before they know it, and I don't think people do this, intent, at least not intentionally, I think they just start sticking up for the plan and all of a sudden now they're making up facts that really didn't happen. Uh, that, that makes it tough for the case. Yeah, and it's too bad that drafting attorneys get so defensive because a lot of stuff happens behind behind their backs, outside their side of view. So if you're going to unduly influence somebody, you're going to probably have them prepped and you're going to be telling them these things so that by the time they go in and meet with the attorney, they're going to say, oh yes, I want it all to go to my oldest son. They're going to be conditioned. And so the drafting attorney isn't going to see any of the conditioning because that all happens outside their purview. And that's really where the drafting attorneys just have no testimony. And that's kind of the, the weak spot for drafting attorneys. But it's okay. And you see some drafting attorneys who want to try to make up for that. But how could they make up for that? They weren't there. They weren't in the home. They didn't see the interaction of the son and the mom every day and what was happening. And they don't have to. Drafting attorneys aren't required to do that. The only thing a drafting attorney is required to do 
is to determine for themselves, not legally, but just for themselves, can this person give me instructions? And if they are satisfied that they have a client who can give them instructions, then they have to follow that client's instructions. That's what you're required to do. And if you feel like you have somebody sitting in front of you where you can't follow their instructions, then you have to decline the representation. You have to say, I'm sorry, I'm not going to be doing this for you. Those are really the only two choices of a drafting attorney. So it's always a little perplexing in my mind that an estate planning attorney decides to become an advocate. They want to support their plan. And I think in part they want to do that so that they can say, I didn't do anything wrong. Well, a draft, it's, it, it could be equally true that a drafting attorney did nothing wrong, but also that an amendment is invalid for undue influence because the undue influence happened before the elder ever got to the drafting attorney's office and there was no way for the drafting attorney to know that how would they know that they didn't have a prior relationship with the elder how would you know that and so both of those things can be true and so the uh, drafting attorney really just needs to testify truthfully and then let the court and the legal system figure out whether or not the amendment from a legal perspective ultimately is deemed valid or not but it is funny how much they fight against that for no good reason and there's a deposition that you took not that long ago where you were uh, deposing a drafting attorney who said, made mention of something about, well, I might have destroyed my notes. And, and I think your follow-up question was, you destroy your notes? And as soon as you asked that question, the look on the guy's face was, you know, was worth a million bucks. Just that look like, oh, I shouldn't have said that. But that's what he did. That's what he said, and that's probably what he did is he literally would take notes of meetings and then throw them away and not put them in the client file. And so it, you know, why would you do that? I have no idea, but that's what they did. And that's, that's what we're dealing with. in you know, a number of these cases. Yeah. I think, I think in that case, you also had the, the lawyer doubling down because once they, sometimes when people make statements and depositions, they, they tie their ego to it or whatever the case may be. And they don't, they don't walk away. And I actually got him to agree that his process and procedure for doing estate planning there was like multi steps to it. Like let's let's say it was seven steps. You know, meet with the client, uh, determine if there's undue influence, determine if there's a lack of capacity, uh, draft the documents, meet with the client, sign the trust. But his last step in his process and procedure was to shred the notes. And so uh, I basically, for the next half an hour, just kept asking him as many times as I could in diff different examples. And it's is it at this point that you would shred your notes? And, you know, and do you think it's a good idea to shred your notes? Well, he thought it was a great idea to shred his notes. And once he said sure. that, I got him to say it over and over again, which is fantastic for the case. Now that case resolved pretty quickly after that, but yeah, that, that was a, that was an interesting one. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a great idea to shred my notes. I'm a big note shredder. <laughs> oh, and then, yeah, I think at the, I think at the end of that deposition, I did actually say, hey, hey, now that you've had some time to reflect on this, do you think it'd be a good idea not to shred your notes? And he still disagreed with me. No, I like to shred my notes. So I was like, okay, <laughs> shred your notes. Go ahead. I do. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it kind of begs the question, why take notes in the first place? Yeah, right. I love taking notes, but I also love shredding them. Yeah, the shredding part's the fun part, I guess. So. Yeah, well, that's true. I, yeah, everybody loves putting the paper in the shredder. I do. Um, <laughs> I don't usually do it for late legal cases I'm working on, but usually it's just for old bills. So I think that all of this kind of comes to the point of, and this is why circumstantial evidence is actually kind of confusing to understand. And I think that's why so many clients struggle with it. Because when you say, how are you going to prove the case? There's no one answer. You can't just say, I'm going to prove it by this one document, or I'm going to prove it by this one statement. Really the answer, especially at the beginning of the case, the answer is, I don't know. Uh, we have a lot of discovery to do. We gotta, we gotta get medical records. We gotta get financial records. We gotta take depositions. We gotta see what witnesses are out there. There's so many things that we have to compile because just like building a house, you have to bring in the lumber and the plumbing and the faucets and the wiring. And really that's probably the best analogy because you have to put all of those things together. And then over time, as the evidence is sifting in, you can get a feel for, okay, we're, we're telling, we're compiling a good house of evidence here. Looks like we're putting together a good story or we're not. And there are certainly cases where the evidence goes from bad to worse. And unfortunately there's just not a whole lot there, but that's something that has to be evaluated over time. And it can be frustrating, I think for clients, because everybody wants to know, you know, do I have a good case? Is the evidence there? How are you going to prove it? 
but you simply cannot answer that question, you know, so quickly, I think, in these types of cases. Would you agree with that, Stuart? You, well, I mean, you can't, right, right up front, you're never able to say there was undue influence, there wasn't. But yeah, I, I think that as you build the case over time, and then, you know, clients also, uh, they sometimes think that something's really important when it isn't. And then there's times where um, there, there's something that's really important and they don't get the, the gravity of how important that issue is. And so that's, that's why it's important to be a lawyer. I, I'll give you an example. We have a case right now where uh, we've taken over a case from another law firm, a previous law firm that represented our clients. And, and that law firm didn't do a very good job, at least in my opinion. Uh, maybe they did great work. It's just not work that I would do. But there was at one point, you know, they basically sent discovery to our clients and said, answer this discovery. And the clients are not lawyers. And they answered all discovery requests for admissions and everything. And sent it back to the lawyers. And the lawyers just took it and printed it out on a paper and sent it off to the other side. There the answers are. And it's like, time out. I mean, obviously, we as lawyers cannot coach. We can't make facts up. We can't. Uh, but it's our job to make sure our clients understand the ramifications of what it is they're saying in a case and what that means to the case. And of course, we want everyone to be truthful. Uh, you, you know, one thing I found, judges are very good at sniffing out lies. Juries are really good at sniffing out lies, 12 people together. So just always be honest. But that doesn't mean be ignorant at the same time. And if, and I, I don't mean ignorant in the sense that you're stupid. But if you're not a lawyer and, and you don't know the answer, just like you don't know about heart surgery. I, I think we all know enough about heart surgery that we could talk about it. But do we really know how to do a heart surgery? Where's the heart even located? I know it's somewhere in here, you know. Uh, th that's because we need an expert to do that. And that's what lawyers are supposed to do. Uh, they're supposed to help clients develop the case. And it takes time to develop a case, especially this type of case, because there's not a lot of direct evidence. It's circumstantial evidence. It's the story of the case. You got to pull all that together. It takes time, effort. Um, it takes depositions. And, you know, there's many times where you and I will be in a case and, and we're frustrated because it's just not going the way we thought it would. And we take that fifth deposition in the case and all of a sudden that gold nugget comes out of nowhere and it or that beautiful document comes out of nowhere and the timeline connects in your head and you go oh this evidence is devastating and now you understand what the case is about but you know being this is not this type of litigation trust litigation is not for the faint because it's difficult and and you don't always know what the facts are until you're about halfway or maybe all the way through the case and then things crystallize and pull together I will say most cases resolve in mediation, which is good for both sides. Uh, most cases, you know, a retired judge is hired and um, after extensive discovery and depositions and, you know, both sides beating each other up, uh, the cases resolve in deposition and everybody can move on with their life or resolve in mediation and everyone can move on with their life. But there are some cases that do indeed go to trial. And in those cases, we either have to prove the case or we have to shift the burden to the other side and then they have to dis disprove that they were not involved in undue influence. So hopefully this has given people a taste that this is, it's not easy. I mean, it's not AI can't answer this for us. You can't go to chat GPT or uh, wherever you wherever you like to go for your AI answers. You, you, you can't go there now and say, hey, how do I win my case? Here are the facts. The computer is going to give you some ideas, but th this is truly an art form in proving these cases up. Yeah, it really is an art form and it comes together over a, length of time just like building a house and you have to be careful because again i think a lot of clients will focus on the fairness that's what they really uh con concerns them the most and that makes sense i mean from a personal level i would probably do the same thing but from a legal level the fairness is kind of one of the minor issues and it it, it is an element of undue influence and equity and then an inequitable result but it's minor relative to the other things that we have to prove. So you got to be patient. You got to put in the work. You got to do your subpoenas. You got to do your depositions. And then you got to see where the cards uh, fall. And hopefully, you know, you can make the best of it as you're putting all of that together. Yep. So any other thoughts, Stuart? No, I'm, I'm, I'm all thought it out. <laughs> and it's Friday. So, well, I want to thank everybody for joining us for another episode of Ask Two Lawyers. As always, you can put questions on this topic or any topic you want in the comments below. We do look at the comments and we're happy to answer those questions on a future episode. Please remember to subscribe. <laughs> I can't talk today. It is Friday. Remember to subscribe to our channel and hit the notification button so that you know when we put out videos and when we go live. We put out a lot of videos aside from 
our live stream. And we certainly look forward to seeing you again next Friday on Ask Two Lawyers.